Hello, my peeps, and welcome to the final episode of Passionate People and Preposterous Peeves. I'm your host, Ike, and before I forget to, I'd like to just take a moment and say thanks for being here and giving this pod a listen. For all this time, it has been a lovely journey, and I'm glad you joined me for it. It really means a lot that you chose to use your precious time and give me and my guests over all these years your ears. Now, without further ado, the final guest is the first guest. It's my friend, uh, occasional co-conspirator, and one of the people that really helped get this ball rolling, the one and only Eric Burgo. What's going on, man? Oh, nothing too much. How are you doing? I'm uh, <laughs> I'm doing good, but it, it is it is bittersweet to do this episode after all these years. You were the you know the first person to come on. You got run through. It, it's funny looking back. It's I think it's like either nearly tied or the shortest episode by far. I don't really remember because it was like forty minutes. Just cooked through it because I was so nervous and I didn't have. <laughs> the comfort and the calm to kind of wait. So while I don't want to take all of your time today, definitely uh, anticipate on hopefully using these skills I've cultivated over the last three years to give you a, a better shake and also talk to you about something wildly different. But before we get to that, is there a term that you use in your line of work or industry that few people know of, but it sounds really silly? Yeah. Um, so I think one of the things that we're going to talk about a little bit later is math. And uh, recently I've been getting into these things called uh, formal verification systems, where it's basically you can write a math proof on the computer, um, just like you would write a computer code for something else. And it turns out that one of these systems, the, the way that it's spelled is C-O-Q, and it's pronounced cock, uh, <laughs> not coke. Or anything, anything else. It's 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 literally pronounced cock, and I don't know how it ended up that that's what the name so was in your chosen line of to work, be. But <laughs> so in your line of work, is it an acceptable thing to turn to another math man and go, "Nice cock"? <laughs> or is that uh, is that a little too? <laughs> that 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 is something I have not yet experienced. Uh, but it's you know at some point yeah, it might. Uh, when it might when you get farther along and your your <laughs> <laughs> your logarithms are really are really doing it, maybe somebody will turn to you and give you such a compliment. Yes, uh, yeah, but it, it might be unnatural though. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of math, what is your passion today? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it's actually interesting. I, um, you had mentioned to, that we might be talking about something completely different this time around. And I intentionally did not go back and listen to the first episode because I couldn't remember any of my answers. And I thought it might be like a good idea to actually do it blind. Um, <laughs> so the, I, I don't know what we talked about last time. I genuinely can't remember, but, uh, the thing that I wanted to talk about today was math. Um, so the, you know, basically the trajectory of my life has been pretty interesting. Um, you know, I spent uh, the better part of a decade uh, as a mechanical engineer after college. Uh, and I essentially decided to leave my career and, and go back to school for, uh, to study uh, math at a, a higher level. And you know, not, now only, that not only, not only you're making it sound very, very basic. Not only did you leave your career where you more or less, as I understand it, had some amount of tenure as you were able to keep your position, even though you took an extended hiatus to hike the PCC. Uh, so I actually, uh, so I didn't maintain my tenure. So uh, I actually, so I worked for, uh, I worked for Apple uh, at a school uh, and then I ended up quitting uh, okay. to go hike the PCT. Yeah, the PCT, not the, the PCC. Um, and oh, right. yeah. I ended up going back and I needed to get rehired, uh, to do that. So that was, uh, a, a, an interesting thing to navigate, uh, was, you know, okay. quitting. so, you know, you I got... didn't, I didn't anticipate going back. Sure. Uh, but, but you I, were I, able to, you had good enough standing and respect from either colleagues or your bosses that you were able to get rehired. Correct. 
Yes. Yeah. So yeah. you uh, you're that good in your field. You left. You did this thing. You came back. You moved to Texas. You bought a house, <laughs> yeah. and then. Yeah. So I guess um, it's important to put uh, the timing of things in in context uh, because uh, I had hiked the PCT in 2019, and when I went back uh, to work, it was the beginning of COVID. So it was, it, it lined up almost perfectly uh, with COVID sort of emerging as thing, a thing people were starting to pay attention to. So I think I actually you know, officially moved to Austin in uh, January of 2020, um, which, you know, I, I had originally moved out to California and I was, uh, from New York, and I, you know, I, I built a life, a life for myself, and I said, "All right, I'll be able to do the same thing in Texas. It's an emerging area," and that just didn't happen, and it was entirely because of COVID. But uh, the connection to math and to what we're talking about is, you know, just like everyone else, I was really, you know, isolated and in, in my house, and that isolation sort of led to me getting exposed to higher level mathematics and. Uh, All right, how, hold on. How does yeah. that happen? No, don't gloss over that. Like you know, when you're sitting <laughs> sure. around bored, you just get exposed to it. No, I fucking don't. The rest well, of us sat around. None of us were like, you know, that, no. Come on, how did that happen? Well, the answer is actually it's very simple. It's it was YouTube. Um, so you were going you know, some, down some different rabbit holes than the rest of us. Yeah. So I, I mean, I, I think this is something that people including myself, just continue continually like fail to recognize, which is that people's experience on the internet, even using the same social media app or YouTube, for instance, is just completely different than the one that you have. Um, so like, yeah. you know, my YouTube recommendation page probably looks very different than <laughs> my parents' YouTube recommendation page, for instance. Um, and I have worked really hard over time to sort of, use YouTube to curate an information diet of, you know, like technical information, um, like you know, things for, that I can learn from. Um, and one of the things that happened over the past, let's say decade is a, a number of people have worked relatively hard to really utilize the, like the highly visual nature of video and, and YouTube to explain mathematics. And I think the the, bas the biggest example of that is um, Grant Sanderson. Uh, he runs a channel called Three Blue, One Brown. And- um, It sounds like a he, drink recommendation. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think that the, the, the name actually comes from the fact that he has some uh, condition where the irises on his eyes, they're not one solid color. It's, they're three quarters blue and one quarter brown. Um, wild yeah and uh he wrote this software called nanum which is a package you can use in python for free it's available to everyone and it just makes really high quality animations uh for uh mathematical concepts and a number of people have been using this uh both uh, just through sort of like natural em emergence and also because uh he runs some like video is some video competitions um, where you know, people can use that software or anything else to make uh, a video explaining some math concept. Um, so he is, I would say the best example of, of that specifically, but there's also just been a huge flourishing of uh, just many different kinds of educators who have moved to YouTube because uh, the available audience is just so much bigger. Uh, than anywhere else that they could, uh, you know, try and educate people. Um, so I think that there have been people who have, you know, started to take that more seriously. Uh, and, you know, it's, uh, it's something that I was aware of, you know, for like most of my adult life, but, you know, there's just something about sort of being like really bored in this, not bored, <laughs> but like you, you just have like, so much less freedom than you used to have 
uh, yeah. where, you know, it just forces you to find new ways to, to use your time. And I think uh, that sort of, you know, just sort of allowed me to, to look at it again and take it more seriously. And I said, okay, you know, I'm really interested in this stuff. Um, yeah. So were you let's, not let's working do at the, were, you, were you not able to work at the time? No, so you... I, I was working uh, at the time. Um, and I think... And you were still bored. So, <laughs> uh, you know, I think COVID was difficult for a lot of people in a lot of different ways, of course. Um, but, you know, one of the interesting things about working at Apple was, you know, it was it was always this way, but it was also true during COVID where they would let you work as much as you wanted in the sense that like, if you were um, like doing your job and sort of like meeting the minimum thresholds, like you would never like be asked to like do more or like be overworked or anything like that. Yep. It was just very rare that people were, you know, complaining about management saying like, like you, like you have to work like more and more and more. Um, but a lot of people like took it upon themselves to you know, work more and just like, you know, work a lot of hours during the week. This is just natural for tech, unfortunately. Um, and it was true during COVID too. So, you know, especially in the beginning, it was actually really nice to have sort of like an unlimited time dump where it's like, okay, I'm stuck in my house. I'm always <laughs> able to work more. But then like a lot of people, I think I, I very quickly realized that it, just working all the time, it, being in you know essentially one location all the time is just terrible. Yeah. Almost no one, no one can do that, myself included. Uh, so, you know, I just had to regulate how much time I was working. And, you know, that involved me like you know developing the you know the personal skills to say okay i know i can do more here i want to do more and i'm just gonna like turn my work computer off and go you know cube with my friends over skype or whatever it is uh and that was surprisingly difficult for me um so like you know during covid it was like very easy to find things to do because one of them was work. I, I just had this outlet where it was just like, anytime I, you know, was bored or whatever, just go work. Uh, and then I said, all right, I can't do that. Yeah, and I just started watching a lot more YouTube videos uh, about math. And uh, it's just like, okay, this is what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. So, <laughs> so how, <laughs> how did you go from, I am enjoying watching this, like, to, because, I mean, you while engineering is in you know the stem field it isn't like it isn't 100 percent math right i remember talking to you about this yeah. and my initial thought was oh of course you're going into math it's engineering it's so close and you're like they really aren't like they're they're neighbors but they're not like related yeah the, i would i would say that that's very much the case um my thoughts on this have evolved a little bit but i think in general i still agree with uh, my past self in, in, in broad strokes, um, especially in like college when I was, you know, being taught mathematics, mm -hmm. it was, you know, you're being taught with mathematics in the sense that math is a tool that you can use to solve engineering problems and you're an engineer and that's all math ever is where it's like, this is, you know, something that we've figured out and here's the stuff that we figured out it's being handed down to you. And that was really it. And I think like, it's very much the case for engineers because the reality is, is that almost all of the engineering that takes place nowadays, you know, okay. There's obvious counterexamples to this, but like most of the engineering that takes place, it's, you know, it can be described by, you know, relatively basic linear algebra and calculus. And if, you know, if you're able to do like even like a basic, like, a, like if you have a basic understanding of those things, you can really uh, do a good job of modeling and figuring out most engineering problems. So when you're teaching math to engineers, you've done your job. But 
with math and being a mathematician, what you're actually doing is you are coming up with new ideas and new proofs of mathematical statements. So there's a certain sense in which you've shifted what math is to uh, you know something that's like this, like being viewed as a tool to this entirely you know different object where it's like, all right, this is this. It's not even an object. It's like a playground almost <laughs> where it's like, all right, you know, I think maybe one of the, like, I'm, I guess I'm having a little bit of difficulty sort of describing my thought or like you know, describing my thoughts here, but there's a certain way in which like the amount of restriction and the amount of freedom that you have is a good way to, to model what I'm talking about. So I think a lot of people go through school and they go through math class or whatever, or they go through math class and they're learning how to factor polynomials or God knows what. And they're given like a very specific set of steps to go through in order to do that. And it gets presented as this very rigid, like processed based endeavor where it's like, these are the steps, go do them. And it's basically the entire opposite experience when you're doing research mathematics. You essentially have complete freedom over any questions you want to ask, as long as you follow a relatively simple set of rules, which is like, you have to be perfectly precise in the statements that you make in the sense that like, there can't be any ambiguity over the statements that you're making. And mm -hmm. the claims that you make uh, have to be logical deductions. Okay. And those are like, those restrictions and those rules are, you know, very general uh, and oversimplified for, you know, the purposes of this conversation. But, you know, the point is, is that that represents... Wait, wait, hold on. No, no, no. In full detail, please. Our audience is yeah, very, yeah. very intelligent. Okay, so there's a thing called ZFC, and it's an axiomatic set theory. Okay. So, I, I mean, like, the, the point is, is that, like, is that, like, when you're when you're actually doing this, this, this thing, which we call research math, mathematics, it's this very free experience, um, as long as you're sort of, uh, you know, meeting those qualifications. Um, and it actually ends up being this extremely creative endeavor where you're being asked to solve problems where nobody knows how to do it yet. Uh, and because no one knows how to do it, you, you quite literally cannot have the experience of someone giving you the steps to, you know, factor yeah. that polynomial or whatever it is. So you have to come up with it. Yeah. And there's no textbook where you open it up and go, Oh, that's the answer. Exactly. And I mean, I think myself included, just the overwhelming majority of people are just not aware that that's even something that you can think about, or they just don't even know that, like, this is something that other humans spend their time doing. And like, this is their so, career. So uh, in the hit TV show, I think it's like season one of the hit TV show, Rick and Morty, there is this joke that people initially thought was a joke. And then I saw a physicist responds to kind of thing and at one point he says science is more like or he, he talks about the art of science in that it's like it's tricky and not like as if there's like this code and the guy paused the video and goes yeah like when you reach like top level like science it's more like an art than a science and that you are there is like norm no normal like a plus b equals c you know, this reaction plus this reaction equals this, you are playing off the edge of the map. So if I'm understanding you correctly, this kind of sounds like one of those situations where math has become less math and more art. Is that, is that kind of ringing any bells sounding any, in any way true or. So, uh, yes, I would agree with, with, you know, basically everything that you're saying there. Um, it's not that I would describe it as more art and less math. It's just that it's the math has become art. It's it's also <laughs> art as well. Okay, it's Marty. So, yeah, it's Marty. <laughs> I thought it was Morty. Is not the, <laughs> I was saying math and art. Is yeah, Marty. I, 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 I know. I know. I but yeah. ruined my uh, joke. Oh, see, I thought I was enhancing, but uh, it turns out it turns out Classic you can look at the same. math guy. It you turns think he out just cubes it. He thinks he makes it bigger. <laughs> Well, well, no, it's just, it's, well, the, I, it's, what's funny is the point that I was, was going to make is that you can actually, 
sort of view the same, like one of the overarching ideas of, of math is uh, you can look at the exact same object in two different ways, and that ends up being a really powerful thing. So you were describing it as like being less math and more art. And it, the reality is, is it feels like it's, it's math and it's art. It really is yeah. both. You know, um, and I, I should also note, you, you, made a, you made a point about being at like, you know, the top level. And uh, I'm very clearly not uh, in that place. Uh, like I'm, you know, one year into a master's degree, which is, you know, the degree that you get before a PhD. So I, I have a, a long way to go in terms of reaching that level. Should I, I mean, get there? in the super nerdosphere, yes, you are not. I am not talking to the grand poobah. However, compared to the rest of us plebs who are like, I know how to do algebra. You're a math genie. It's deal with the deal with the <laughs> helmet, buddy. Yeah. But, um, but w one of the things that you, you had mentioned was uh, sort of how messy the, the process can be when you're trying to figure things out. And that's that is very true, both in the, the math domain as well as the engineering domain. So, you know, I said at one point that I had sort of updated my, my opinions on math versus engineering or the, the comparison of the two. Uh, and one of the things that's, uh, that has, uh, it's like very present in both is that, that messiness where you really, it, it feels like you're in the fog of war constantly and trying to figure things out is a, a very difficult process. It's particularly because when you do figure things out, you often feel like an idiot afterwards because it seems, <laughs> because it seems so obvious. Yeah. Like I, you know, it's, it's so like, I, I just, I've lost count of the number of times I've been like in a room where, you know, there are a dozen well-paid, smart engineers thinking about a problem. And we talk about it for an hour and no one has any idea what to do. And then people bang their head against the wall for a couple of weeks and someone comes back and there's a simple solution and everyone is embarrassed that they didn't see it in the first place. And it turns out that that happens in mathematics a lot as well. Um, there's just, you know, something about you know, being on the boundary of where you like, you don't know things and no one knows them. It just makes it so difficult to sort through the process or to sort through things. Um, is there any amount of kind of stillness or calm that that gives your fear knowing that not only are you lost, but everyone else is, or is that bothersome to you? Oh, uh, for me personally, uh, yeah, it was, um, extremely, I don't want to say encouraging because it didn't make me <laughs> uh, happy to know that other yeah. people, um, we're, we're sort of in the same state, but it was reassuring in the mm. sense that, uh, you know, particularly with math, there is, it's very easy to be intimidated. Um, and, you know, that's something that I still struggle with. And I think I, I, I will always struggle with. Um, but every single mathematician I've talked to, every single one says that, you know, mathematicians reach a point where they just hit a wall in understanding and, you know, their intuition taps out. And the only way that they're able to, you know, eventually get past not being able to understand something is to, you know, take a class on it and then not do well and then read a book and not understand it and then come back a year later and finally get it. Yep. And you just, you, you don't hear about that sort of stuff in the education process the first time around. Um, it's, uh, it, I, I think uh, as I've been exposed to the idea, it's kind of, it, it sounds very similar what you're describing to as Einstein's patent office, where the idea is that you, to understand something, you need to give yourself distance from it in a way. Hmm. Is, that, is, is that kind of similar or is this different? Uh, yeah, I think... Um... Yeah, I think it's similar to that. Um, I know, you know, personally, there are a lot of times where I'm struggling to understand something and putting it down and then coming coming back later often helps. Uh, and that's a 
a, a common thing to, among mathematicians where it's just, you know, look, look, some people are like legitimate geniuses and they, they make themselves known very quickly because they have <laughs> the ability, you know, right? Like they have the ability to learn things very fast and that continues until you're, you know, 30 or whatever. And I'm serious. So like, you know, there's this classic thing of, you know, most like super high power mathematicians, you know, only being particularly productive when they're early in their careers. Interesting. Um, and then, you know, that eventually taps out. Uh, but, you know, for, for most people, I think, that, you know, they, they, it really is a grind. And it really is about uh, how much effort you put in, not how smart you are. Uh, because with a lot of this stuff, even if it's not cutting edge research in math, you know, it's, it's like the math that someone came up with 100 years ago, it hasn't changed at all in the sense that every statement that they've made is precisely the same. Uh, so it doesn't inherently get easier to understand. Sure. Um, maybe people have figured out a better way to explain it in these sorts of things, which can help, right? Like, I think we're probably a lot better at teaching calculus now than we were 50 years ago or 100 years ago, you know, just because we've had a lot more people teach calculus and yeah. we've figured out what analogies work and what don't and all these sorts of things. But, you so, know, save or go ahead. So you're, you're talking about old math and it's still being taught is there like I know in certain fields of science, there are ideas that get disproven or you know addendums added or what have you and so learning science in you know different decades or different centuries is vastly different other than the amount is there any like theories or ideas that are generally disproven in math that go away or do most of the ones that get proven kind of stand the test of time and we just add to it and become a bigger and bigger book that is a, an absolutely fantastic question um Yay. So the the uh, the answer is you know save uh, some exceptional cases where there you know a proof has been done incorrectly and you know there was a genuine mistake. Yeah. Say, um, you know, save experiences like that. We only ever add to the okay. body of knowledge to mathematics, and you know there there are cases where you know mistakes happen and, and things like that. But for all intents and purposes. The, the answer is that you only sort of grow this this tree of knowledge or this this web. Um, in practice, it's a little bit different though, because as we uh, sort of expand our knowledge about mathematics, one of the things that happens is we we realize that you know two entirely different groups of mathematicians are talking about the same thing without realizing it. Um, and when that happens, uh, some ideas can get dropped in the sense that they're not part of the, uh, like the often taught, uh, established math, because in some ways these things, these, these techniques or these ideas, we're describing the, the same thing. And this one is just a lot easier for us to understand and use. So we do it. Um, so stuff can get dropped and left by the wayside, but it never goes away. Um, and mm. one of the things that, that's cool about math is like, there's a certain sense in which you get to have a connection with people from a long time ago, because, <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, in, in, a, in a very serious way, like, no, yeah, it's beautiful. It, it really, you know, it really is like, you actually get to have, it's, you know, it's only one direction of correspondence, but you, do <laughs> actually, you know, it only ever you know goes forward, but you do get to actually, you know, use ideas from from these people in a way that you don't get to in, um, you know, physics or biology, uh, because like you were saying, you know, ideas do genuinely get replaced and proven wrong in these sorts of things. Uh, and, you know, mathematics doesn't have that, uh, that, that same inherent replacement. So you talked about your, just your one year into your master's program, what are you hoping, how far are you hoping to get? And what is your kind of dream involvement with math at the moment? Where, where do you, you know, if you could write your own story with a, you know, perfect pen, 
where do you end up? Yeah. So, um, I, I actually don't have a good answer for you. Um, Mother. And- <laughs> I, I, I can espouse on it for quite a bit, but uh, the interesting thing is, if you had asked me two years ago, I would have had a, a very open and shut answer for you, and that was I was going to go get a PhD, and then I was going to find a way to do math research as as much as I can, um, and that would likely mean being a professor um, at, at a university uh, that mm-hmm. uh, that does math. Uh, one of the things that's happened in the last couple of years is uh, the the rise of AI, and, and and this is something that I have been paying attention to for a while now, uh, and it's pretty clearly the case to me that the uh, the pairing of large language models with these software systems called formal verification systems. Yeah, the thing that 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 cock joke <laughs> I made earlier, um, these have these these are just going to essentially crush mathematics, um, and even uh, like very recently, within I think the last week or so, um, Google DeepMind announced that uh, they had basically engineered a system that pairs a language model that you know generates these uh, potential mathematical proofs with one of these software systems that checks mathematical proofs. Uh, and it did very well on this thing called the IMO, which is the International Math Olympiad. Um, and in just the same way that uh, very early on, computer systems were not able to beat humans, we're basically in the same stage now with these large language models and mathematics. I should say these, you know, these language models paired with formal verification systems and mathematics. And the reason why this is relevant is because, you know, once the technology scales and it gets better than humans in just the same way that it got better than humans in chess, once that happens, the experience of being a mathematician and what it what it means to be a mathematician is going to change a lot. Um, and unfortunately, I don't know what it's going to change into. Um, there's people who have some ideas about what that's going to look like. Um, but the reality is, is everybody is guessing. So my, you know, this is, I, sh- I should be really clear here. This is just an opinion I have. Um, you know, nobody really knows what's going to happen with this technology. It might stall out. I see no reason to believe that that's the case. But I'm anticipating that, you know, in the time frame of when I would be finishing my PhD, which is, let's say, five to six years from now, I'm anticipating that within that time frame, computers will be better than humans at writing math proofs. Um, and they'll be better in a way that is uh, similar to the way that they're better than us at chess. And when that's the case, I, I don't see how humans keep up. Like, I don't, I don't see how we get to meaningfully contribute to that endeavor. Um, which, and just to be really clear here, when, when I decided to leave my career, I did not see this coming. It was before ChatGPT came out. Um, I didn't even know what a language model was <laughs> when I quit my <laughs> job. Um, but you know, as someone uh, who who sort of understands engineering and, and how things scale, um, the sort of the physics of these language models and, and what happens as we get to make them bigger and bigger and train them on more data, all signs indicate to me that. Um, I'm just not going to be able to keep up. And that's also going to be true of every other human. Um, and I, I just, I don't know what it's, what it's going to be like to quote unquote do mathematics w- when that's happening. Um, I should also say that, you know, what I'm talking about is uh, not going to happen instantaneously. Okay. It's not, it's not going to be like it is today. And then one day 
you know, some, com- you know, someone is just going to announce that we have this thing and, you know, now it's, now it's here. There's going to be a transition over time. There is a lot that needs to be done in terms of sort of translating our current mathematical knowledge over. Um, that's, you know, that's happening already. Um, but the sort of minutia of proof writing is, I think, going to go away. Um, and that's weird because in some ways that's all that mathematicians are trained to do, um, is to write proofs. Um, and you know, when you have a tool that does that for you, uh, maybe everybody can be a mathematician or maybe nobody wants to be a mathematician when you have that. I, I don't know. Um, so if that is, is the if that becomes the case will you still want to be involved in mathematics or is that something that will kind of kill lesser diminish that dream to more of like a, a pastime uh i can imagine both things happening uh depending on how things shake out so like i you know, I just want to be really clear here. Like my, my, my opinions and how I think the future is going to go are speculation and I'm extremely open to being wrong, right? You know, it could be the case that five years from now, the tools that we have now have not changed meaningfully and doing math and being a mathematician is exactly as it is today. If that's the case, that'd be great because that's what I signed <laughs> up for. <laughs> um, you know, you know, assuming that doesn't happen, you know, it does end up in this in this world i'd like to think that i'd still spend time doing mathematics and um devoting my time and energy to it but it's also the case that if that does happen it's also going to be true that everything else in the world is going to change in some very significant way um just because the uh sort of the, the, the like how mature your technology needs to be in order to achieve what I'm talking about necessarily means that you're going to be able to do so many other things with the technology um, that uh, it just, you know, it's going to change what the world looks like. So, you know, I'm, I'm sort of in a position where I'm anticipating that the world is going to change quite a bit over the next decade. Um, because of AI uh, and mathematics is just one of those domains. And, you know, assuming that there are still interesting problems left for us to solve and we're able to understand those problems, then yeah, uh, I think I'll be involved. Uh, but it, you know, it might be the case that, you know, this like in the amount of time that it would take a human to understand the results from, you know, the previous output of, you know, some machine, it's already gone and, you know, asked 10 new questions and, and, you know, provided proofs for them. So we might just be in a position where we can't keep up. So, uh, yeah, if that's the case, then, uh, I probably wouldn't do much math. <laughs> I might be interested <laughs> and I might look up qu- answers to questions from time to time, but I don't know if I would do math. So there's one thing that we haven't really gone over that you have done with math. And I think it's just the last year that while the computers could do it and there is aspects i believe if i understand it correctly that you have kind of instilled computers and programming to use you do something that is a lot of art with math uh yeah i so i I, I, are you referring to some of the art that that i've made that's correct uh yeah um so i actually haven't made that much of it over the past year um but yeah this is something that i've done done in the past and uh that was actually one of the things that really happened over covid um that sort of you know allowed me to say hey like maybe i should spend more time thinking about mathematics (laughs) who is (laughs) making math art um and that was a really enjoyable experience um you know partially because uh it just sort of I would even say allowed me to think about uh, the sort of thing, the sort of things I'm thinking about is like, oh, like I can't actually, you know, think about mathematics and come up with new ideas, 
So, uh, yeah, I, I'm sort of struggling to, to, to think um, of what I can say. Because so how, how did is, you... No, the heart is extremely visual. Uh, <laughs> well, how did, you get in, how did you get the impetus or get involved in doing something like that? Where did, where did the idea for that come from? Where did the intrigue... Where, how, how did that come to pass? Because that, yeah. to me, seems like such a novel and under, you know attempted thing yeah so uh i guess one of the things that i didn't talk about that maybe i should have uh when answering an earlier question was you know yes it's all it's it's very much the case that youtube was a big part of how i was exposed to higher level math but another big part of the story was um was because uh of a another hobby that i have uh which are uh, twisty puzzles. Um, if you've ever seen a Rubik's cube, that is the canonical example of a twisty puzzle. You know, the, you know, the basic idea is that you have some shape, and you're able to, you know, twist certain parts of it. And the idea is you want to get each face of the shape to be all be the same color, just like a Rubik's cube. And it turns out that there's this huge space of different puzzles that you can make that fit that description, different shapes and uh angles that you can turn things by and all that sort of stuff um and it turns out that when you start to generalize that concept of what like a twisty puzzle is and you start to do that in two dimensions rather than three dimensions um it turns out you get some very interesting behavior and that behavior is you know fairly simple to describe uh, but it's not been analyzed by mathematicians before. Uh, and it turns out that the uh, analysis that you do ends up producing some spectacular visuals. And those visuals ended up being the art that I produced. Um, but I should be really clear here. I was never interested in producing art. And I was, um, you know, never really, you know, I never really had that on my radar. But, you know, over COVID, uh, I started to, you know, look into some of these problems related to, you know, two-dimensional twisty puzzles. And that exploration just naturally led to this art being made. And the art, like actually generating those images, it actually helps me understand how the system behaves more. Um, so just to give people uh, an idea of what, or an, an idea of the art that we're talking about, um, it's uh, fractal-like. Uh, so if you've ever seen like the Mandelbrot set uh, or, or any of those like zooms of fractals, it's similar to that, uh, but it's generated in a totally different and, and novel way. Um, and in much the same way that you can generate like a lot of different or uh, like images of different um, with, with different qualities when you're looking at the Mandelbrot set, you can generate images with different qualities when, when looking at the system and understanding how uh, the system behaved. It was very easy to do that just by looking at a visual representation for it. And that visual representation ended up uh, lending itself to uh, producing some nice art. So, so that's why I did it. So it was, re <laughs> you know, really, it was really motivated uh, by trying to understand the system more. Um, and I like so is looks, that so something <laughs> <laughs> is that something that god forbid or you know cur current the way we currently conceive of the idea of ai kind of taking over math and probably the rest of the world if that was to come to pass is that something that you would find yourself still enjoying going back and doing and kind of for lack of a not not to diminish it but play with or is that something that you did then and it's kind of in the past for you so it's mostly in the past for me, and part of that is because even when I you know generate another image, it doesn't feel like I'm making more art because the actual process of creating when you're doing that sort of thing is writing the program which generates the art. It's mm -hmm. coming up with the mathematical idea that led to you know you being able to write the program that does it. So the actual like process of creation 
in some ways has already happened. Um, and you know, to I guess give you like or put a fine point on it. At one point, I had even you know essentially written a tweet bot where uh, at any frequency I want, it would just procedurally generate a new image that had never been generated before, save the image, and then tweet it out. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, there was literally no human involvement at that point. Mm -hmm. um, just so that gives you a sense in which, like, once the pro, when, once the software was written, the act of creation is, uh, I'd say almost entirely over, at least for me. Um, so in, in many ways, it feels like it's in the past for me, but uh, I certainly do not uh, close myself off to that sort of experience again. Uh, if, but it would very likely be in another domain. Uh, yeah, like I wouldn't go back and make more of this that art, yeah. I would say. But art of a new kind, sure. <laughs> so if there's someone for math art for math proofs with what which would have you that you could collab with is there someone out there that you would really love to you know be around kind of get to pick their brain while working with them in yeah. the field of mathematics yeah i'm currently collaborating with them <laughs> oh sick who is it uh it's, it's not announced yet uh but there's a there's oh, okay a, there's a, a math YouTuber who uh, was very inspirational to me. Um, oh, so cool. And, yeah. And uh, so you're getting to work with one of the guys that kind of got you into the biz. Yes. Um, so awesome. Yeah. It really, yeah. It really does feel like I'm living the dream. <laughs> it's just like, Hey Eric, That's... how's your life going? Oh, I don't know. Uh, I'm basically living my dream life. So yeah, things are going pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, yeah, if the, if things are going well. well, let me diminish them a little bit. In Great. movies and television. Are we talking about politics? No, no. we're going to talk about movies, <laughs> dipshit. So in movies and television, they often showcase many passions, often incorrectly, but occasionally correctly. In film and media, what are some examples of the way they have portrayed them correctly or incorrectly? Any standouts? Oh, sure. So... How about every single movie that's portrayed a mathematician ever? Uh, okay. What are they, what are they doing wrong? It, look, it looks so perfect on screen. What are you talking about? Well, yeah. So, I, I mean, this is, I think, one of the big differences uh, that is apparent to me now, in addition to how mathematics is, is taught. It's just how it's actually done. Like, in movies, there's just constantly this lone genius... Uh, uh, persona that's attached to mathematicians and they're often very closed off from the world um, in, in these sorts of things. And, and the reality is that mathematics is a highly, highly collaborative endeavor, uh, both in the moment of, you know, ideating mathematic, uh, mathematical ideas, like coming up with new ideas and things to try. Mm -hmm. um, and also in the sense that just it, this is something that's so difficult to describe, but just <laughs> the, the the amount of mathematics that's out there is just it's it's staggering. Um, the in in part and this is in part because of what we talked about earlier, where in the sense that stuff doesn't get replaced; it only ever adds. Yeah. Okay. So you know when someone writes math. It's, yeah, it's, you know, it's just been a tree that's been growing for as long as we've started doing this. It, exactly. And it just there's so much math out there. And there there's just no way that a single human being could understand anywhere near all of it. So, like, you know, there's a couple people who are regarded as the best mathematician in the world right now. Or like, there's a very short list. You know, uh, like Terrence Tao is one of these people. P Peter Schultz is, is, is one of these people. The, like they will, they will be the first people to admit that they know, you know, far far less than one one percent of mathematics. Oh wow! Okay. It, it, I mean, like honestly, you know, I, I think one percent doesn't even begin to cover it. It's just, <laughs> it's just, it's so huge. Um, so yeah, it, it just like because 
there's so much math out there. It's impossible for one person to, to understand it. And that necessarily means that there needs to be a network of people, a group of people that have some shared understanding of this entire thing that's going on. Uh, and that can't happen unless there's a, a really intense collaboration from people. So this collaboration happens both you know, in the moment of, like in the act of, let's say the act of creation of, of new mathematics, but also in the sense that the corpus of mathematical knowledge that we have, it's stored in books, of course, but it's also stored in the brains of, of all of the mathematicians. Uh, and, that, and that is a very you know, collaborative experience. Um, so when, when, you know, mathematicians are you know, shown in the movies, you know, frizzy hair, antisocial, you know, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure you can, you, you can picture it in your head. Uh, and that, that, that couldn't, that just couldn't be farther from the truth. Uh, when you look at, uh, what, what mathematicians behave like, uh, in practice. So are there any that you remember seeing where you're like, Oh, actually, no, they're not too far off there. Like, are there any that are a little bit, perhaps mm -hmm. more the, the 1% of movies and film where it's like, they have a moment. It doesn't even need to be the whole entire expose of it, but like, are there moments where they, they kind of actually got it for a second? Um, you know, nothing immediately comes to mind, but uh, I've, so I've never watched Star Trek myself. I'm just, I'm not a sci-fi person. I'm a fantasy person. Sure. Um, but I've heard people say that uh, they do a decent job of representing scientists in Star Trek. I don't know how I don't know how true that actually is, but honestly, it's pretty rare to to find I think a a good represent excuse me a good representation of like anything in the movies. Uh, okay. I mean, this is I, I really don't think this is true for for scientists uh, or, or mathematicians um, it, only. I think it's it's true all over the place. Sure. Well, in a kind of similar wavelength, what would you say is the biggest misconception about mathematics by the wider world in mm -hmm. your, you know, recent revelations of being in the program for a year? I'm sure you've told family and friends. What what have they come back with and like kind of said and you're just like, ugh. Well, uh, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll indirectly answer your question. So. Huzzah. Uh, <laughs> Classic uh, math guy. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so, um, you know, I've had the uh, pleasure <laughs> of, you know, ha conversing with people and saying, yeah, I, I, I quit my job and I'm going back to school. And they're like, oh, what are you going back, what are you going back to school for? And then I say math and almost in like almost guaranteed there, like, there will be a negative response. Uh, <laughs> oh, I'm not a math person. Oh, I hated math. All these sorts of things. Um, but a lot of people feel like they were just not math people. Um, and I think a lot of people were wrong. I think most, the overwhelming majority of people are math people. Um, and the reality is, is that, uh, we've just done them a disservice of teaching them mathematics wrong. Um, it really is a joy. I, I think a lot of people do actually enjoy the process of being creative and you know developing solutions to problems and thinking about things in interesting great ways which like that's the that's the core thing like that's the real that's what math is it's that sort of stuff um and when you when you expose people to that uh most people enjoy it um so in terms of misconceptions i think a lot of people just don't understand what math is because I didn't understand what math was and uh, I feel like I'm starting to get it now. And I think a lot of people uh, <laughs> would enjoy, enjoy it. So I think you kind of explained the next question I was asked, which is your favorite non-obvious aspect. But if there's another one that's something that people didn't realize, or you even maybe yourself didn't realize you would experience getting to take this pathway that you now have. Yeah. Um, I guess I would agree that in, I, I, 
I, I sort of already partially answered that question by accident. Um, but I'd say related is that I think even for me, like I tend to be a pretty ambitious person. Um, and I knew that what I was trying to do, like you know, trying to go back and get a heart, like a math degree at an older age, it's like, that's, it's tough. It's hard. And I'm starting to be successful now, but that's only after many years of work. So the, yeah, I'm only one year into this master's program. But that was preceded by a year of a lot of sort of relatively intense preparation uh, to get ready for that. Uh, and that process involves a lot of failure, a lot. And that doesn't go away. It, 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 I still fail a lot. Every mathematician I know still fails a lot. Um, some people think about the same problem for a decade. Um, and I think a lot of people just think that they can't do it. Uh, but the reality is, is that I think most people can. And it's about, you know, being able to build up to something big over time by doing a lot, by making a lot of small efforts and a lot of small improvements. Um, and, you know, there were a lot of, you know, in some ways I'm, I'm surprised that, I, you know, I'm able to understand the things I'm able to understand now. In some ways I'm, I'm not. Um, there's a lot of complicated ideas that I'm able to hold in my head where if you're, you know, if you told me what they were two years ago, you're like, what, what are you talking about? Like, like <laughs> these words don't make any sense. And like, what, it, like, what does that mean? Like, how does anybody understand this? And, and you can chip away at these things and it takes time and it takes effort. And it takes patience. But I think a lot, you know, I think a lot, a lot of people have that in them. Uh, and, and for whatever reason, they don't think they do. I think a big part of that has to do with the experience they had of being educated, but um, it's different for everyone. Well, just like everybody has that in them, everybody in them has a preposterous peeve. My friend, what is the one that you have brought with you today? Yeah, so this is something that uh, I've been thinking about a lot recently. Um, so I moved from uh, Austin, Texas to Queens, New York. Um, and for whatever reason, I spend a lot more time like waiting online for something now. Like, you know, like physically, like I'm in a line at a cash register or whatever. Okay. And I don't know what it is, but there's just a relatively high density of people around me who will just be completely unaware of the fact that there are people behind them in line. And <laughs> they just like, they just waste time at the register, you know, and it might not seem like that big a deal, but you know, for every you know unit of time, like, you know, that person wastes gets multiplied by every single person that's online behind them. Right. Because, you know, if they hold that line up for a second, it makes every single person in the line later by a second. Yeah. Which that adds up quick. Uh, and I think a lot of people just, you know, fail to recognize this. And, you know, it doesn't seem like that big a deal. But, you know, when you start to think well, about... Well, you start how... to do the math. <laughs> yeah. You start to do the math about how often people are waiting on lines for things. And you just say, oh, my God, the amount of human time that gets wasted because... You know, people wait, you know, don't have their wallet out of their pocket or whatever it is when they walk up to the, to the desk. It's like, <laughs> it's staggering. And you, look, I, you know, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about like you walk up to the register and you haven't decided what you want to order yet or whatever. <laughs> it's just like you were waiting online for two minutes and you were on your phone. And now you're there and you're going, uh, and <laughs> you're holding it up. And it's just, it's it's very frustrating. So I've tried to limit the amount of time that I've had to wait online because I don't trust other people, man. I don't trust, I don't trust other people with my time anymore. <laughs> I love how gr waiting on lines is grammatically correct, but it also sounds like you're either saying it wrong or talking about something else. It's like you know, one of my you, favorite aspects about this. Okay. So I, you know, this is very interesting. I am now that 
you you made that statement. I'm not sure if I was saying online or online. What was I saying as I spoke there? They're both correct. Are they really? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Because it's plural. I'm waiting on like throughout my day. I'm waiting on lines, and throughout and to and right now I'm waiting on. I guess it'd be on a line, not on online. So I think you were oh. saying it in plural, but yeah. Oh, that's, that's just it's just very funny because it's like it sounds like you're waiting on the internet and not oh. like behind <laughs> yeah, no, people. No, yeah, this is this is all happening in meat space and yeah. <laughs> space. <laughs> so no, actually, this... I, I wait I wait online in uh, in the metaverse. <laughs> <laughs> I wait online in line on, on lines. Line. So do you have a story of perhaps where this? peeving proclivity shown the boldest and perhaps you know got you more bent out of shape than you normally have been uh so i wouldn't say uh i got like bent out of shape or anything like that i, I don't really lose my cool but <laughs> i didn't uh, i didn't get bent out of shape i bent the other guy into a different shape yes i wouldn't say <laughs> I... <laughs> no uh i was running late recently and uh i literally just so I, it was at a there was like a a, a Walgreens that lived um, close that's close by and people were just taking a long time so I just put my items down and just walked out of the store. <laughs> <laughs> I just said, I just said all right I'll, I'll just get these. Oh, look, later. I need I know I need this medicine, but I'd rather fucking die. Than oh, oh, no, <laughs> it wasn't medicine, but yeah, it it was like I was just picking you know, like random toiletries up or whatever. It's like all right, I'll I'll go somewhere else. Like literally, I will do this any other day. All right, what? I, I've I've got a I've got a breakdown for you. Which is more bothersome, somebody coming up to a register at a deli and going, uh, "I don't know, they all look so good." What would you recommend to the person behind the counter? Or you're at a checkout line at a grocer's, and the person starts to talk about something unrelated and just get into a conversation mm. that stops the clerk from doing their job. Uh, I would say though the latter would be more frustrating because the first the, the first person that you were describing is at least making an effort to, <laughs> to to do what they need to do right, whereas the other person is not. Uh, All right, what if the second what if in the second scenario it's a long lost friend and they're like, oh shit, Dave, I haven't. Oh my god, I didn't even know you moved back. It's been what two decades. Uh. So, uh, I actually okay. So no, okay. So interesting. Okay, so here's the thing. I actually, you know, I, I wouldn't be angry at that at all because, like, you know, that like that person committed no faults, right? Whereas like, they didn't know that that person was there. But you know, if they stood there for a couple minutes, you, you know, like, sure. You know, if they real, but I don't know. I, I guess I was, <laughs> why is it? Why is it? Okay, so like this is one of those. <laughs> Dude, like, this math is like, all right, we don't know these basic <laughs> these basic things about numbers. It's like, all right, uh, let's go uh -huh. work on that for a hundred years. Yeah, and, yeah. And it's just like, all right, this like very complicated question about uh, like how you manage time and what your uh, reaction to it should be. It's like I have no goddamn idea. It's like I, I, I'm still working on circles. You know, it's like <laughs> <laughs> I haven't even gotten to squares yet. <laughs> Squares are easy. No, squares are easy, man. Circles are complicated. Cir <laughs> circles are stupid. I'm not even joking. Circles are so complicated. <laughs> I mean, I I know what you mean. I've tried to draw a circle once. It's in fucking possible. It is. It is so. No hard. one's ever done it. No one. Yeah. You got to take a cup and get a pencil, and then you can't accidentally bump against your finger. It's the worst. If you're really anyway. Yeah. <laughs> lastly, before we throw it to our final commercial break. If you could have listeners of this podcast hear one song you were choosing, which would it be? All right. So the, the, the name of the song is uh, One Wish by Raven Lene. Um, and this is like pretty far outside of, uh, I would say, the genre of music that I normally listen to. But uh, a friend sent me this song and it is just an earworm. So it's a really, really nice listen. All right, and with that, we're going to throw it to our sponsors. So Eric here can have a minute to put on the sea rubber suit before we get all up in the writing round. But if advertisements aren't your thing, why not have a listen to One Wish by Rave Lene? Or if you really want... 
Is it, I think it's raging. I said what I said. <laughs> the link will be in the description. He said what he said. <laughs> if you really wanted to hear a song from a previous episode, please check out the playlist on Spotify. Passionate People and Preposterous Peeves Podcast Song Rex. It's a long title, I know. Don't worry, there's a link in the description. Either way, see y'all in a bit. This podcast is sponsored by Russian Puppets. One of the easiest things you can do with your hands and a light source in a dark room. Over human history, millions of people have used Russian Puppets to great enjoyment. With limitless possibility and no upfront costs, Russian Puppets will have your hands busy forever. Or until the power comes back on. So what are you waiting for? The power to go out? Oh yeah, right. Okay. Well, but when it does, we'll see you and your on the wall. And we're back. Eric, are you ready to enter? I'm so ready. Let's go. All right, buckle your seatbelts and keep your arms inside the ride at all times. Would you rather, in a public setting, dance naked in the snow or walk over hot coals? Dance naked in the snow. Do you create your own thoughts or do you just listen to them? Oh, Jesus. Uh, just listen to them. <laughs> it's like a, that is a deeply philosophical question. Yeah, all right. Would you accept $1 million under the condition that 0.1% of all cars become invisible only to you uh yes <laughs> oh god what a strange question uh yeah i uh, just i would never drive again <laughs> a million dollars crossing so much money. a crosswalk i'd pay someone to do that for me <laughs> <laughs> did you ever cheat on a test in school uh yeah when i was young um i cheated on uh like english tests for uh <laughs> for because, book reports uh, yeah Album? yeah uh, yeah it's like it was like did you it's like oh like we had a reading assignment for homework and i was like i didn't read so like i would ask quite kids from the previous <laughs> class like hey what are the questions on the test album shuffle or playlist Ooh, uh depends on the mood i so i have a couple playlists that i've been curating for like i don't know it's probably a decade at this point but uh shuffle is how is one of the ways that i get exposed to new music and then there are some albums that i try to listen to from start to finish is there such a thing as a perfect piece of art uh yeah i think that there are a lot of perfect pieces of art um yeah uh, definitely i think uh, especially uh, if the person who created the art says that you know it perfectly captures what they were trying to do but yeah i think that that can be perfect are hot dogs tacos uh no hot dogs are not tacos uh, that is my final answer but they're topologically equivalent <laughs> would you rather eat nothing but insects for a year or go without electricity for a year oh god uh go without electricity for a year yeah i don't want to eat, eat, eat nothing but insects for a year that sounds terrible do people who prefer pepsi to coke deserve human rights uh yes everyone deserves human rights real controversial <laughs> are you out of touch or is it the children who are wrong <laughs> oh my god do it so i got back in school now so the the, the youth uh no they're, they're they're in touch uh i think I, I mean, uh, I'm out of touch. Yeah. Are you being the person Mr. Rogers knew you could be? Yeah, I, I yeah, I try to be really kind uh, to people. Not great would, at it, but getting better. Would you rather have tentacle arms or kangaroo legs? Oh, kangaroo legs! You can first of all, are, like arms have hands on them; it's they're super important. And then with kangaroo legs, you can just jump around, jump right over those cars. I can't see. Make the food or do the dishes? Uh, make the food. Easy. Easy. Well, while we're on the topic, do you think you could eat 37 of your favorite food for $5,000 in a one-hour time limit? 37 peanuts? Yeah, no problem. 
<laughs> ha ha. Well, either way, you survived the lightning round. Wahoo! We did it. Now, it as a reward by Gelding. I was about to piss off the youth. <laughs> Definitely a major concern. <laughs> Well, either way, as a reward, my gallant guest, I grant thee a lightning round question of your own for just this last episode. What you got to blow my and the guest's minds? So, uh, you know, I commented that one of your other questions was deeply philosophical. Uh, and I'm going to also I'm going to add another one of those. And the question that I have is, uh, do you think my concept of blue is the same as your concept of blue? Like when, when we look at something that's blue. Just like, does my blue look like your blue? Say the same for all other colors. Um, no, because there's just like varying degrees of color blindness. So I think the likelihood mm -hmm. that that we have the same concept of blue is not likely. I think it's like, I think it's like a synonym, but I don't think it's an ex the same exact definition. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um. I have no like, idea. I think we. I think. I think if we could take pictures of with our eyes, mm. of like what we exactly see and put them next to each other, they would be different. Like one of them would look like you know, like you could tell them apart. Yeah. But if we describe them using the words that we have in the English, you know, definition, unless you know we're art students and we know like varying de like the names of varying degrees of colors, I think we would describe them to be the identical. Yeah. Like, under most circumstances. Yeah, so I, I definitely agree with the, the latter point that like, like we might never be able to, like this might be an unanswerable question, um, but uh, it's a yeah, yes or I, no question. Of course, it's answerable. Well, <laughs> 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 ah, so this is one of those things that when you start to learn more about mathematics, um, you will learn that the, we like there are questions that you can ask in mathematics which we will never be able to answer. We know that those exist. Um, and this is one of those things that when you first hear it, it's almost like you can't accept it. But we know this to be true. Like we know that there are questions we'll never, like we won't have answers to. I, in, in, in I, I, see, I see what you're saying, <laughs> but to be the nitpicky douchebag guess that I am, you guys are wrong. You guys would be able to answer them. You just don't know if they would be the correct answer. Um, okay. I could rock up and write two sure. and I would have answered the question. Is it wrong? Almost a hundred percent. But that doesn't mean I didn't answer it. I'm going to fill out the form. I will have answered all questions on this test that has been given me. I'm just going to get a zero. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we we will never know if any we will never know if it's true or not. Fact. Yeah. Uh, that that that's what we mean. That's what I guess what we mean by answerable. Yeah. So what you're saying is I am technically correct. The we, best kind of correct. <laughs> you'd be surprised at how much of math is just oh you missed this one technicality and now everything you said is wrong. Tumbling <laughs> down. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's like. Like this is like why writing a mathematical proof is so hard is because you can make one small error at the beginning, and every like if the, the tower you build on top of that can just completely collapse if uh, that one assumption is not there anymore. And as as someone who's been an engineer, you know that that's also true about engineering. If yes, your face is falling. Yeah, it, it is, all it comes is, tumbling it, down. It all, yeah, you need a good foundation to, to build on. All right. So, as we come to a close here, is there anything you want to plug, shout outs you'd like to give, places people can find you, content, your math proofs, which, whatever? Um, I guess uh, nothing to particularly shout out uh, other than uh, definitely check out uh, Math YouTube, Three Blue, One Brown, Number File, uh, Mythologer. Uh, you know, those are sort of the standouts of the really, really great channels. But uh, there's all, there's just so much great stuff out there. Um, and if you thought you weren't a math person, um, maybe you are. Uh, and, uh, you know, take another look. Uh, so, yeah, I, I would call to action. Go do that. Uh, and if you can't do that, then just be kind to each other. Well, I think we need that. We need that right now. And we're going to need more of it in the future. Um, 
that's going to be a very valuable thing. Right on. Well, thank you, Eric, for being my guest today. And a special thanks to my editor, Richard Ashford, and my composer, Joshua Gibbons. And thank you. Yes, you listening at home, or have you found time to appreciate this? Time is the most precious commodity we have, and I appreciate you spending years with us. And this is the part where I normally say, hey, subscribe, like, share. But this is it. It's all it's all done now. It's no more. It's one more finale episode coming out. Hopefully the week after this one might be a week later. Um, at the end of the month of August, it will likely be coming down off of Spotify and iTunes. So download those as you can. Should be on SoundCloud for another year and it'll be on YouTube until the sun blows up. A uh, special thanks to our one and only awesome patron, Sabella Yellow. You really couldn't have done this without you. Thanks, Mom. And yeah, I appreciate that. And all of you that listened for all this time, shared it with friends, came on, or just recommended it to somebody. Thanks. I couldn't have done this without you. And like my guest here said, as the days move forward, be kind to each other, listen, try, fail, and try again. Take care.